Welcome to Harborside Online. We're so glad you're able to join us today for this message. If you want to partner with us to produce more resources like this one, feel free to go to harborsidechurch.org slash give, or you can donate by texting the word Harborside to 77977. We hope you enjoy the message. The captured service was last Sunday night, and this Sunday night is going to be great as well. We're doing some really cool things on Sunday night. And when she was saying that about like boating and golfing, is it okay if I go boating on Sunday morning and just come to Sunday night? That was a great idea. Anyway, um, tonight's going to be fun with the Indiana Wesleyan, 64 of these students who love the Lord, love Jesus, and they're really, really good. So you're not going to want to miss this. But last Sunday night was a captured service. What does that mean? That means we capture it, we film it, and we send it out. And then thousands and thousands of people watch us online. They watch the messages. They watch, listen to music. So last Sunday night, I wasn't responsible for anything. I just got to be here. It wasn't preaching. It wasn't my week. And I was in the back back there with Danita. And our oldest, Erica, and uh, son-in-law, Jeff, uh, had the baby back there, Asher. And so Asher's 10 weeks old. And the captured service got a little loud at the beginning, which is great. We're having fun. And it's a little loud for an infant, so Denise said, I'm going to take Asher out and go in the lobby. I said, great. About that same time, another um, young woman was walking out. Notice how I said Denita was young also. Another young woman was, was walking out, and um, I followed her out. And I said, um, is it a little loud? And she said, yeah, it's a little loud for his, his ears. And he's about 12 weeks old. And I said, um, do you want to worship? She said, no, that's okay. I said, no, no, no. Do you want to? She said, oh, I'd love to worship. I said, I can do this. I said, give him to me. <laughs> and I said, what's his name? And she said, Maverick. And she hands me the pacifier, and she runs in here. <laughs> it's a true story. Can't make this up. So I got Maverick, and it's too loud in here, so I go out in the lobby where Danita is, and also Michelle Alexander with her new daughter, and Danita said, who's that? I said, it's Maverick. <laughs> she said, who's his mother? I said, I don't know. <laughs> who's the father? I said, I don't know. What's his last name? I don't know. How long do you have him? <laughs> I'm clueless. I have no idea. Now, most women, most wives would be concerned about that. Danita just went, okay. I mean, she's used to that for me. I have Maverick for 45 minutes. <laughs> Maverick and I bonded, all right? He was awesome. And I prayed over him. I prophesied vision and wisdom, and he's going to be a mighty man for God. He slept most of the time. I'm walking around thinking, I hope she comes back. I have no idea. And now I'm struggling. What did she look like? <laughs> so when Denise is asking me all these questions, I got to thinking about that. This is really kind of funny because I don't know. I don't know his last name. I don't know. And, and I, I apply that to our topic this morning. Let's be honest. There aren't always answers. There, there aren't always answers. We're all trying to figure out the meaning of life. And we can figure out some things, and we can figure out more things, but let's be honest, we can't figure out everything. When I think back to when I was in my mid-20s and 30s, and let's say it's a tunnel, I was able to figure out some things of God, but there still were a whole lot of things about God that I really can't get my mind and my hands around. Well, now in my late 50s, the tunnel is still long. I've got more of God figured out, but if I'm honest, I still can't connect all the dots. I still can't make sense of all the things that happen spiritually, theologically, philosophically. You've prayed, and you've gotten answers to your prayers. And some of those prayers make a whole lot of sense. But you've also prayed, and you've not gotten the answer that you thought you would. We've done 21-day fasts. In those 21-day fasts, several of your items and concerns have been answered. But there's probably, if, if you're honest... If you have a long list like we do, there's still five, six, seven things on that list that have not gotten answered, and I don't know why. So the topic today is, let's just be honest, there aren't always answers. And we're going to go to Job and Jesus, and then Job and then Jesus. So say that with me. Job, Jesus, 
Job and Jesus. I just don't want you to get lost. And if you're a first-time guest and you've not been to church in 20 years, God bless you. That's all I can say. This, this, this is going to be a tough one, but get something. You don't have to get it all. Just get something out of this as we go forward um, together. So here we start with Job. In the land of Oz, I think Dorothy was right, in the land of Oz, there lived a man whose name was Job. The man was blame. So what is he? He's blameless. He's upright. He fears God. He shuns evil. If you know nothing else about Job, and you, that's all that you know, what would you say about Job? He's a great guy. He's a, he's a great man, isn't he? I mean, those are some incredible uh, adjectives to describe someone. Now we learn about his family, seven sons, three daughters. Then we learn about 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen. Why does it tell us all that? Because he was wealthy. And the wealthy represented, that was very good. The wealth, you should be up here preaching. The wealthy, the wealthy were in that, in that culture, they must be blessed by God. If you don't have anything, that means you were, you were cursed by God. That's not true today, but that's what that culture thought. Then we learned this. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Now, that's a great description. Now, here's where the violins come in. Here's where the music changes. Here's where we can't connect all the dots. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. Right off the bat, we're going, huh? The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan said, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless, upright. A man who fears God and shuns evil? Well, does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? I mean, God, you've blessed the work of his hands. His flocks, his herds are spread throughout the land. But now, God, just stretch out your hand, strike Job, strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And we know what happens next. We know that the, the archangel Satan, the fallen angel Satan, Satan, Lucifer, was able to strike him, struck his flocks, struck his children, struck his fortune, struck his own body. And what did Job's own wife conclude? What did she say? Curse God and what? And just die. She was not an optimist, that's for sure. So this is a tough situation. And Job is in something very difficult. Now let's go to Jesus. Stay with me. Job, Jesus, and then we'll come back to Job and back to Jesus. Now, here's Jesus. Now, in this story, there's several things that Jesus says and does that go, huh? How does this make sense? Jesus looked up, and he saw a great crowd coming toward him, and he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him because he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, you know what, Jesus, how can we feed these people? It would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. A year's wages, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year wages maybe, so twenty-five dollars ish $25,000 for everybody just to get a morsel. That's interesting, isn't it? Well, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Well, here's a boy with a sack lunch. He's got five small barley loaves. He's got two fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down about 5,000 men. So what that means is 5,000 men, 5,000 women, and about 2.2 kids per family. So there's approximately 20,000 people now on this hillside. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish, and when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. You should be scratching your head right now if you've just heard this for the very first time. Huh? Takes 25K, just everybody get a bite. Everybody had a buffet, and now there's all this leftover, all these baskets of food left over. So they gathered them, and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. What is going on there? Now, so here's the next part of the story, and all in John chapter 6. So everybody's been to the buffet, everybody's eaten, and now it's evening time, and Jesus sends the disciples across the lake in a rowboat, a great big boat. 
But instead of going with them, Jesus walks on water. That's the story where the storm comes up, and Jesus, you know, scared them all out. They thought it was a ghost. No, it's just me. And he gets in the boat with them. Peace be still. So now the crowd who ate the buffet the night before goes, where'd they go? That was our meal ticket. How come they're not here? And then someone said, I think they went to the other side of the lake. So if we pick up this story, again, these are things that don't necessarily make sense. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered very, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs. What was the point of the miracle? The feeding miracle was a sign. The sign was, I have the power to do something so big and so great. The sign was about just the, the, the food was just a sign that pointed that he was the Messiah. And it was a food miracle because they loved Moses. And they all honored Moses for years because he fed us in the wilderness the manna. You got, got the connection so far? We're going to keep going. Very true, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. And then Jesus said to them, don't work for food that spoils, but work for food that endures to eternal life. He's not saying quit your job. He's not saying don't go back to school tomorrow. Okay, have you heard me? All right, you got that? Study hard, go back to school. I'm counting on you, okay, to take over the church someday. So keep going, all right? He's not saying don't get an education. What, what he is saying is, you think you're, you're working, it's a dead-end job? No, 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 no. There's a higher purpose. Your job is a means to an end. All of your resources aren't to go just for you. Some of your resources are for kingdom purposes. And he's saying, don't just work for food that spoils, but realize that your, your, your value has something far greater. Don't just work for food that spoils. Well, he keeps going. Jesus said, look, guys, you love Moses. And you give Moses all the credit for feeding you in the wilderness. But, but honestly, and he tells us this in this chapter, he said, it wasn't Moses who fed you. It was my Father in heaven who fed you. We just used Moses. Moses was the conduit. He said, look, I'm the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus just keeps ratcheting it up. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They can't make sense. It doesn't make sense. How can this guy, this carpenter, be greater than Moses? How can he give us bread that will never get hungry again? How can he feed us forever and forever and forever? And of course, he's talking about eternal purposes. So they really are upset with this. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And in this chapter, Jesus says, you got to eat my flesh, you got to drink my blood. And now they're going, is he cannibalistic? What, what is this? And Jesus is prophesying about communion, the Lord's Supper, like we just did a few minutes ago. We eat his flesh and we drink his blood. Every time we gather around the Lord's table, we remember his blood that forgave us and his body that strengthens us. And then they begin to argue. The Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. What do you do when you can't make sense out of Scripture? What do you do? Where do you turn when you can't make sense out of what God is doing? They can't make sense out of this. They're arguing sharply among themselves. They said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? All right, we're going to come back to all this. But let's stop and talk about this for just a minute. We live in an upside-down world. And we're all invited to live on this earth in an upside-down kingdom. You're invited to come into a kingdom that's completely upside-down. Well, let me start first with the upside-down world. This world has been turned upside-down. I would never say this at a funeral. I would never say this when there's a tragedy. I would never say this to Lisette's family that just is going through. I would never do this. But here we are as family talking about this in a safe setting. This world has been turned upside down. God told us that the day that we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that day you will what? You will surely, you will surely die. And at that moment when they did that, 
death, disease, sorrow, illness, cancer, miscarriages, genetics going AWOL, everything you could possibly imagine went wrong. At that moment, you could now be the victim of someone else's free will. At that moment, you could be at a four-way stop and somebody could be all tanked up on alcohol, run right through there, kill you, kill your family. At that moment, the things that happen in this world, they begin to make sense. They begin to make sense. Because we live in a world today that is completely upside down from the intention of the garden. However, before we get back to the kingdom, the king has invited us to live in a kingdom today that's upside down on this earth. And so you have to choose which of the kingdoms you're going to plant your life in. This is an upside down kingdom. How upside down is it? Well, it's really upside down. It says if you forgive, you will be forgiven. And if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And if you're forgiving, then other people will be forgiving and your Heavenly Father will forgive you. It's an upside-down kingdom on forgiveness. It's an upside-down kingdom on our enemies. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That is an upside-down kingdom to pray for our enemies that God will bless them it's an upside-down kingdom. If you want to be great, and who doesn't want to be great? Nobody woke up this morning and said, you know what, today I want to be a loser. <laughs> Nobody said that this morning, did they? I want to be great. You want to be great. Everybody in the room wants to be a part of something great. He says, if you want to be great, you must be servant of all. Wow. And so that doesn't mean that you quit your job or you get demoted. That doesn't mean you have a lower position. In fact, I think he wants to continue to promote you. But as he promotes you, you become a servant. I love the phrase that says, you rule with the heart of a servant, but you serve with the heart of a ruler. You rule with the heart of a servant, but you serve with the heart of a ruler. It's an upside-down kingdom. He says, if you want more money... You learn to give more money away. He says, if you want to not have as much money, then just learn to hoard all the money that you have. Proverbs says, I want you to see this. Nobody believed me on this. I actually wrote it down. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. It's an upside-down kingdom. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. He teaches us that if you want to find your life, you must lose it. And if you lose your life for me and for my purposes, you will actually find it. It's an upside-down kingdom. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. When I teach younger pastors and do other conferences and conferences and workshops, I teach, I teach younger pastors, do not shoot for the numbers. You shoot for the numbers in your church, and you will never grow your church. You learn to love people. You learn to honor people. You learn to care about people. You learn to always want something for them and not something from them, and you'll have to build new buildings. It's always about losing your life, and you will find it. You want to make yourself great? You become a servant. You become a leader who leads with the heart of a servant. Jesus said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So when the tragedies of life come, and the theological buzzsaws are in front of you, who or what will you place your trust in? So for 37 chapters, Job is asking for an audience with God. 
Job is trying to tell all his friends, I'm innocent, I'm morally pure, I'm great with servants, I'm great with my leaders, I pay my employees. He's trying to tell everybody how great he is. And listen to what happens after 37 chapters, Job 38. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. That's a clue right there. The storm is coming. And he said to Job, he said, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. Now, when God says that to me and you, that means, oh my goodness, here it comes. Get the seatbelt on, get a helmet, because I, it's not going to be pretty, is it? This is going to be painful right now. Where were you, Job, when I laid the earth foundations? I mean, tell me, Job, if, if you understand. God uses sarcasm. I knew it was biblical. I knew it was. I'm going to go home and tell Danita it's biblical. It really is. Do you know where the mountain, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? The Lord said to Job, Well, the one who contends with the Almighty correct him. Now, I've tried to correct God before, I have. That's so foolish. And I've concluded that I don't want a God that small. If God is that small, then he's really not God at all. And the longer I'm in that tunnel of faith, I realize that God is really, 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 really big. I not only don't know all the answers, I haven't even thought up all the questions yet. And every time I put God in a box... He hands me a bigger box. And every time I go forward with God, it's like, I, I think I got this figured out. A door gets opened, and all of a sudden, it leads me into an auditorium of truth and honor and things I never even thought about before. It, some of it is the mystery of God. Some of it is the journey. It's the journey with God that grows you and transforms you. Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once. I have no answer twice, but I will say no more. You know what this is for Job? This is an oh crap moment right here for Job. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm in this. He's in it. Thick. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I'll question you. You're going to answer me. This goes on for chapters, folks. Chapter 38, chapter 39, chapter 40. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. And God says, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me. Now, we come to Jesus. And Jesus puts a bow on this for us, as he always does. Jesus has been telling them, I'm the bread of life. Moses is great, but I'm the son of man. Jesus is telling them, showing them, look, Moses was used by God. I can actually do these miracles. I just fed 20-some thousand people with five loaves of bread and two fish. I, I am the great I am. Jesus is just ratcheting up, and, and they're struggling. They're struggling. He's telling them that you must eat my flesh, you must drink my blood. They're so lost, they're so confused. Is he cannibalistic? No. And so we come to the point now where Jesus has thousands of disciples and they're walking away. They're walking away, they're walking away, walking away, and he's left with the 12. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Hold on. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus says, does this offend you? In other words, you can't handle the fact that someone greater than Moses is here. D does this offend you? What I'm getting ready to tell you is a game changer. Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? What's he saying? I'm God. I was there. I helped create the six days of creation. You, you think... The little feed miracle something, that's nothing. What if you see me ascend to where I was before time began? Jesus says, look, the Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. You know what I think that means? I think that means they felt it. Even though they were confused, it meant they felt it. 
And there are times in my life when I'm scared to death to make a decision about something and go that direction, but I feel it. I know what I'm supposed to do. And that's where your head and that's where your heart have, have, have this challenge. Jesus said to them, you can't figure all this out, but you know I'm real. You just saw the healing miracle. You know I'm truth. And, and many of these people walk away. Will you walk away? Will you walk away when he tells you to do something and it doesn't make sense, but in your heart you know it's right, you feel it, it's him inside of you? It's spirit and it's life. And that's the perk of now having the Holy Spirit inside of you and on you. My words, said Jesus, are spirit and they are life. Yet, yet, even though your heart's telling you what to do, and even though it's me, and even though the Holy Spirit's leading you, yet there's some of you who aren't going to make it. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. And from that time on, many of his disciples turned back and, and no longer followed him. So here's what happens next. And this is you. And this is me. And we'll all have to make this choice. We'll all have to make this decision. Every single one of us fall into this category. You don't want to leave too, do you? I, I don't know why the cancer. I don't know why the miscarriage. I don't know why the infertility. I don't know why the car accident. I don't know why the marriage came unraveled. I don't know why the kid went, went off his rocker. I don't know. And, and we have those struggles and those challenges, and, and we try to put all the, we don't know. We can't put everything together. But Simon Peter has the answer. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Here's what Peter's saying. I don't know, but I know who you are. I don't know, but there's nobody better. You, you and you alone have the words of eternal life. And so if you don't turn to God in your theological buzzsaws, who are you going to turn to? And, and what are you going to turn to? And Simon Peter is saying to us, there is nothing and nobody better than a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So, I don't know how old we were, maybe 30, 31, Danita was 27, 28. Um, our first ministry, I was a senior pastor in Memphis, and I think Eric, it was just, just, born a little bit. Maybe Ethan was on the way. Somewhere, Emily wasn't even a thought yet, but anyway, we're, that's about where we are. And, and so we have our first starter home in this neighborhood, and about four houses down, this, this young couple move in. And their names are Wayne and Lynn. Wayne kind of looks like a young Robert Redford, kind of gives you a picture. He really did. We, we called him Robert Redford. And um, they didn't go to church. They didn't have a church background. And so we've been praying for them like five or six months. And so on a Sunday morning, they're at church. And Danita said, hey, I saw Wayne. I said, I didn't see Wayne, but I saw Lynn. And then Danita's last words to me were, don't mess this up. The pressure's on. Preach a good sermon. <laughs> a lot of pressure living with that blonde. It's, it's a hard life. You should pray more for me. <laughs> and so, again, I don't know how many months it was, half, half a year, four or five months, um, they both walked the aisle, and they both became Christians, and we baptized both of them, and it was an awesome story. That's yeah, pretty cool. And, and, then, and then a few uh, years later, uh, we moved to a different house. They moved to a different house, but we all went to church together. He was a deacon in our church, great family. I had, had uh, two boys at Austin and Evan. Evan was 18 months old, and Evan got lost for about 10 minutes. Lynn was at the uh, flower place buying a bunch of flowers for the outside. Wayne was actually in the front yard working on a mailbox. He was really gifted with his hands and uh, j just lost Evan for about 10 minutes. Evan walked to the neighbor's pool and drowned. Drowned. Ah, oh, that day, that moment, that experience, I've already done this twice. It's just as raw and real to me as it was 20-some years ago. 
And I'll never forget Lynn's response that day. We're back, and Ann and I are sitting with them in the living room, complete devastation. And Lynn turned to Wayne and she said, oh baby, she said, I don't blame you. I don't blame you and I don't blame God. And I watched their faith in a most perilous moment. And I watched the two of them lean in, lean on each other, and just draw the resources from the words that are full of life and spirit. And that's been over 20 years ago. And they today, great marriage, great family. They have a son, Austin, two, other, two, two daughters. Here's my point. You're going to have a train wreck like that. You are. Maybe you already have. Most of us in the room have already had train wrecks like that. Not that one, maybe, but different ones. We all have them. And if you haven't had that kind of a train wreck, and I'm talking to you guys on the front row, you're going to. I'm not prophesying that over you. I'm just saying we live in an upside-down world. And so what do you do when those things happen? Where will you turn? To whom will you put all your hope, all your faith, all your trust? Simon Peter's right. He's saying there's nobody better than you, Jesus. I'm going to put all my hope, all my faith, all my trust in you. And that's the point about this morning. Let's be honest. There aren't always answers. But there is a Savior that we anchor ourselves into. There is a Heavenly Father that we say, I don't get it, I don't understand, must not be your will, but I'm yours. I'm your guy, I'm your girl, I'm your, I, I'm your servant. I'm, I'm going to follow you with all of my heart and all of my life. And that's the decision that every one of us in this room have to make today. We're going to follow him in the good times. We're going to follow him when things make sense. But will we follow him even when life doesn't make sense? Because you're invited into an up upside down kingdom and it is completely upside down and yet that's where the life and the spirit dwell if you're not a Christian this morning I don't know why not there's nothing better to anchor yourself into there's nothing better to hold on to than Jesus and those of you that are Christians in the room make this decision today that no matter what happens or occurs my faith is in the solid rock let's have our prayer partners come down front um, why don't you stand with with me as well maybe it's time for you to give your life to Christ and to get baptized on Easter at the 5 p.m. service we're going to invite you to, we're going to have a baptismal service at the 5 p.m. service we're going to Fill up the baptistry right over there, and uh, we'll have lots of services, a couple on Saturday night, three on Sunday morning, and then we're going to have a, a, a baptismal service. It's a little too cold to go to honeymoon, so we're going to still do it here, and we're going to have our first baptismal service here at Harborside on Easter at, five, at the 5 p.m. service. Give your life to Christ. Go sign up to be baptized at the, at the, at the front desk. All right. We put all our trust in you. You are the bread of life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.